The Book of the American Pit Bull Terrier Richard F. Stratton Chapter 5 Another Glance at the Rearward Abyss What is history but a fable agreed upon? Napoleon My first book was somewhat iconoclastic in several ways. One thing I did was to take on the conventional history of the American Pit Bull Terrier breed which decreed that it originated with a cross of the old bulldog with a terrier. I countered with the idea that the Pit Bull was the old original bulldog and that the bulldog itself was the descendant of a fighting strain that dated clear back to Babylonian times. After the book was published I sat back and waited for the sparks to fly, but, amazingly, I received tons of letters agreeing with me. Many said that they had always felt that the American Pit Bull Terrier was the original bulldog, and all others, of the bulldog or bull terrier type, were simply show dog perversions of the original breed. The only controversy, or disagreement, that came to my attention involved the origin of the American Foundation stock. Here is how it all started with a letter to Bloodlines Fornal, November-December 1975. To the Editor I have subscribed to Bloodlines and registered dogs with the United Kennel Club for a number of years. I have grown weary of reading Mr. Richard F. Stratton's put-down and assassination of the American Staffordshire Terrier. My dogs are dual registered and as you know, many, many others are. The Staff and American, Pit, Bull Terrier are basically the same dog. I can't tell them apart, you can't tell them apart, and Mr. Stratton couldn't if he were put to the test. I don't see why we can't have more tolerance here. They are a great breed. I have been showing and training dogs for over 20 years. Recently, my dual registered gallant titan became the first of the breed in the world to win the protection dog title of Schutzhundai. He scored 98 points out of 100, in protection. This was the highest score ever given to any dog by the judge, who is of European origin and with many years of experience. The Schutzhund, protection dog, work is extremely difficult and arduous and is based on courage and hardness. A dog must perform a tracking test, must retrieve over a six-foot wall, pass an intensive obedience test with dogs and people around, and must be able to run 12 miles and then clear a 40-inch jump. The dog must attack a man, defend himself and his owner and release the attacker upon command or automatically, when resistance ceases. It is of the author judging a fun match confirmation show in California. Complete test of a dog's stability intelligence and fighting spirit. Through it, I found what my dog can do and what he is made of. The useless illegal perversion of dog fighting is not necessary. I don't believe Mr. Stratton could have much experience in training dogs. He suggests they can only be kept on chains or conditioned with an electric stinger. As a dog trainer, I know this is absolutely ridiculous and an insult to our great breed, besides being extremely misleading to the novice dog owner. My dog can go anywhere with me. He will not irresponsibly attack other dogs any more than he would other people. He has been trained and is obedient. On the other hand, he is a tough, courageous dog and has proven it. He represents the greatest breed in the best possible way. Ralph Davis Dallas, 1X The reader will notice that Mr. Davis did not question my treatment of the history of the breed. In fact he later wrote an article in Dog World which gave a view on the breed's history that concurred with mine. It was my answer to Mr. Davis appearing in the same issue of Bloodlines Journal, 
that elicited a response from a third party that brought up questions of history. The following was my response to Mr. Davis. First, let me say I am truly pleased that Mr. Davis's dog received the highest score in the protection area of his Schutz hunt work. Believe it or not, I do take pride in the achievements of the American Staffordshire Terrier, for I believe it to be very close to our breed. However, I suspect the dog that scored second highest was a German Shepherd or a Doberman Pinscher, and it is well known among pit bull people that such breeds have no gameness worth talking about. Obviously, the Schutz Hunt competition is not a reliable means of determining a dog's gameness. I am really not quite clear on how I have put down or assassinated the American Staffordshire Terrier. I have said that the breed is in the process of evolving away from our breed and that they are, generally speaking, not game and gameness, remember, not AP parents, is the hallmark of the APBT. But this is simply a statement of fact that can be verified by practically any pit dog man, and as a matter of fact, most of the older and experienced staff people I know readily concede that, also. I also said that it was folly to change the name of our breed at all, and especially to Staffordshire Terrier, since Staffordshire is the name of an English county, and most of our foundation stock came from Ireland. Is Mr. Davis taking issue with this? If so, I would like to know the basis for his doing so. I don't have any experience at all in training dogs for competition because I simply don't have enough interest to do it. However, I have a deep interest in ethology, and I minored in psychology in college. In fact, I once trained rats to stack marbles in a tray, pigeons to play ping pong, and chickens to dance the jitterbug. So I have some idea of what animal training is all about. And, incidentally, I recommend the training espoused in Dr. Whitney's books, The New Dog Psychology and the Natural Method of Dog Training rather than the forced training methods utilized by most dog trainers. I don't believe I suggested using an electric stinger, in fact, I said it would be akin to kicking a bird dog on point. Most staffs do not have the urge to fight that most pit bulls do, yet most staff people I know recommend keeping your staff confined and on leash regardless of his training. As I have pointed out many times, you are required by law to do that with all breeds in most parts of the country, anyway, so what is there to quibble about? Now comes the question of history. Another point of view. L. Dillon. Bloodlines Journal, January-February 1976. In the November-December 1975 issue of Bloodlines, Mr. Ralph Davis took umbrage at Mr. Stratton's deprecation of the Staffordshire Terrier. I find that Mr. Stratton's misleading statements, made with all the infallibility of a papal bull, and without any substantiating evidence, equally irritating. In his reply to Mr. Davis, Mr. Stratton states, I also said it was folly to change the name of our breed at all, and especially to Staffordshire Terrier, since Staffordshire is the name of an English county, and most of our foundation stock came from Ireland. Is Mr. Davis taking issue with this? If so, I would like to know the basis for his doing so. As it so happens, Mr. Davis had not taken issue with this particular point, but Mr. Stratton, nevertheless, belabored him with it. It is pertinent to note that Mr. Stratton, in the July-August 1975 issue of Bloodlines, had twice repeated the gist of his above quote. I assume, therefore, that Mr. Stratton believes it to be of some importance. I would be most interested to know the numbers of pit dogs imported to the USA from England and Ireland, respectively. 
Both of my parents were Irish, and I would be proud indeed to claim Ireland as the ancestral home of the pit bull, unfortunately, the claim will not stand up to inspection. Certainly, dogs were imported to North America from Ireland, but from where did the Irish pit dog originate? There is little doubt that many came from England. Prior to the year 1840, there are numerous contemporary references in the English newspapers, magazines, and books to the pit dog and the battles he fought. My own investigations through the National Library of Ireland, and other sources, indicate that in Irish magazines and newspapers of that period, such accounts are conspicuous by their absence. This fact causes me no surprise whatsoever, because the particular, unique, set of circumstances which generated the evolution of the pit dog, as opposed to the bull-baiting dog, occurred in one place only, and that place, England. I hope to be able to submit an article concerning these circumstances in the near future. Then, in the decade of the 1840s there was no interest in dog fighting whatsoever, for, in 1845, the staple diet of Ireland the potato was destroyed by the potato blight, a fungus disease imported from North America. Living conditions that year were AP Pauling, conditions which were only to be exceeded the following year by a second potato crop failure. All of Ireland was in agony. Famine and disease rampaged unbridled throughout the land. Catley, pigs, dogs, cats, rats and insects were eaten. It is no surprise that the original Irish wolfhound became extinct about this time. The current Irish wolfhound is the synthesized creation of a Captain Graham. There are records of families eating their starved, dead children, in order to survive. Women breastfed their sick husbands to give them sustenance. The effects on Ireland were catastrophic. The population dropped from 9 million to 4 million. Of the 5 million souls lost to Ireland, half died of starvation and the other half emigrated. Many Irishmen could only afford the short journey to England, and in their countless thousands were absorbed by that man-eating machine, the Industrial Revolution. England, at this time, was the most highly industrialized nation in the world. Irishmen were to be found building roads, railways and canals, burrowing in the bowels of the earth for coal and iron, sweating in the iron foundries of the Midlands and the North. In such circumstances as these, the men of iron met the dog of steel. For the workmen of the 19th century England, life was short and working conditions appalling. For example, in the coal mines, the grimy, naked bodies of men and women, hewed coal side by side for sixteen hours a day. Half-starved, abject, naked infants, aged four and five, shackled by chains to loaded bogies, hauled the coal on their hands and knees often up to their necks in water along mine shafts too low for them to stand upright. For such illiterate people as these, pleasures were few and limited, their whole existence was a fight for survival, and, thus, an abiding interest in the pit dog seemed inevitable, as he lived his life in the same invincible manner as they lived theirs dash, killed sometimes, defeated never. Dogs were rolled during work breaks, and large mixed crowds attended the matches held at weekends. A book would be needed to do justice to these early pit men, their lives, and their dogs. So, it will have to suffice to say, that Irishmen working in England, encountered the dog and were enslaved by his love of a fight and his gameness. Those Irishmen who had made their fortune in England, returned to their native land, bringing their dogs with them. In 1855, one such young Irishman, believing, wrongly, that he had killed another man in a street brawl, fled from Walsall in England, 
back to Waterford, Ireland. Despite the haste of his departure, he still found time to bring with him a 28-pound brindle bitch named Lil, who was said to be the best bloody dog in the whole of Ireland. Two years later, the same young Irishman imported from Walsall a red dog named Mick, a 40-pound pit winna. The offspring of Mick and Lil were snapped up by the men of Waterford and figured in many bloodlines. A sea captain named Dolan, who lived in Waterford, brought several offspring of Mick and Lil on his voyages to the USA. George Stubbs, a well-known singer in vaudeville, toured the theatres of England and Ireland during 1880s. George's hobby was the pit dog, and when he was not working he was involved with his dogs. He was an engaging, lively personality, who brightened many meetings with his humorous anecdotes. George was booked to perform during one Christmas week, in an Irish theatre. Accompanied by a good quality pit dog, for which he had a sale, Stubbs boarded a train bound for Liverpool, England, and from there he would board a ship for Ireland. Stubbs recounted how the train contained many merry Irishmen, returning home for the festive season. In no time at all, his compartment was invaded by a number of these sporting mix, who brought with them another pit dog. A challenge was made, accepted, and fought in the railroad compartment. Spectators were perched up in the luggage nets. According to Stubbs, he had a right royal Christmas. Subsequently, Stubbs made many trips to Ireland involving his pit dogs. He never married, devoting all of his time to his dogs, and he eventually became the doyen of pit men in the mining area of northeastern England. He produced a fine strain of sporting dogs which he exported to all parts of the world some of his best customers being Irishmen. The foundation of his dogs came from the cities of Birmingham and Newcastle. Incidentally, Newcastle is in northeastern England, and Walsall and Birmingham are cities in the county of Staffordshire, England. Stubbs was active with his dogs, until the outbreak of World War II. He died at an advanced age in Norton on Tees, NE England. Mr. Stratton has also claimed that the Staffordshire Bull Terrier is not game. I wonder how many Staffordshire Bull Terriers he has seen in Great Britain. Recent investigations show that dogs are no longer fought in Waterford, but are used for badger draw ing. Because these dogs are not allowed to fight in Southern Ireland, is it fair to assume that the dogs are no longer game? The men who are currently pitting their Staffordshire Bull Terriers in Belfast, Northern Ireland, would consider the statement laughable and tantamount to their asserting that the pit bull is not game. The record well shows that none of the strains of fighting dogs have a monopoly on gameness, and to condemn any one of these strains is not only unfair, but unnecessary. And this was my reply. Reply to Mr. Dillon. Richard F. Stratton. Bloodlines Journal, March-April 1976. In reading Larry Dillon's article in the last issue of Bloodlines, I became so engrossed in his tale of Irish sufferings that I nearly forgot for a time that it was my hide that he was nailing so neatly to the wall. As a reminder to readers, Mr. Dillon took me to task for, one, misleading people into thinking that the ancestral home of the APBT was Ireland, two, casting doubt upon the gameness of the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and, three, he even castigated me severely for belaboring Mr. Ralph Davis with a point he had not even brought up. Well, regarding the last part, perhaps readers will recall that Mr. Davis had complained that I had been guilty of deprecating the American Staffordshire Terrier. 
So I simply restated what I had actually said about the breed and tried to put my remarks into perspective. I had not thought that any of that was difficult to follow. Regarding the ancestral home of the APBT, those who read my book will note that I state that no one nation can make a sole claim to the breed. In any case, I have never tried to claim Ireland as the origin of the breed, however, I have indicated that the bulk of our foundation stock came from there. And it is hard for me to see how anyone could take issue with such a statement, for the importations are well known among pit bull people, and have been mentioned in various old publications such as the Police Gazette, the Dog Fancier, and Pit and Pow, not to mention old issues of bloodlines. Various dog books such as the Armitage and Colby books have also mentioned the importations from Ireland. I'll grant that there were undoubtedly a few importations from inland, too, but my conversations with dog men whose lives extended back into the last century indicate that dogs were available from several countries, but the Irish dogs, and game chickens, were always the preferred stock because they were so renowned for their gameness. Incidentally, the great breeder William J. Leitner once told me that his father and uncle had imported dogs from Freland before our civil war. As for England being the origin of the Irish pit dog, I wouldn't argue with that, but it is an unproven theory especially if we are designating England as the origin of the breed. It should be noted that 15th and 16th century artists, such as the Flemish painter Rubens and the Dutch painter Veldes, have depicted dogs utilized in boar hunts that look every bit like a modern APBT. Also, the Denlinger book on the pit bull contains a copy of an old woodcut that shows Spanish bulldogs that also look just like ours. The old literature of other countries may not refer to our dogs by name, but it does contain references to bear dogs and bull biters. And references to fighting dogs are known from ancient civilized Italians, and artifacts that contain representations of dogs looking very much like modern pit bulls have been found. So the question is, at what precise point do we declare that ancient fighting strain to be our breed? I don't propose to answer that, but I do think we can smile in amusement at the old tales about our dog originating from a cross of the old bulldog with a terrier. As for the Staffordshire Bull Terrier being a game breed, we must remember that the Stafford is merely the show counterpart of the English pit dog. If there are any bona fide pit dogs left in England, I seriously doubt that they are called Staffordshire Bull Terriers by their owners. The Staffords in England may be game as Mr. Dillon implies but it does seem unlikely inasmuch as the individuals presently in this country are largely from imported stock, second or third generation. Even Mr. Dillon, apparently, does not try to claim any degree of gameness for our resident Staffords. As for the present-day Irish pit dog men who would consider my statements about the Staffordshire Bull Terrier to be so laughable, I am told by Mr. Al Brown of Arizona, who has been in recent contact with such men, that they refer to their dogs as pit terriers, and that they no more resemble Staffords than did the imports of a hundred years ago. Although it may not seem like it, Mr. Dillon and I are kindred spirits, of sorts, for we both are sufficiently interested in the history of the breed to do personal research. It is our methods of investigation that differ somewhat. It is my view that Mr. Dillon relies too heavily on old public writings. This may not be the best course in trying to research a unique breed whose owners have traditionally endeavored to keep its very existence a secret, and who have, on occasion, deliberately misled outsiders. The result of this situation has been that the public view has always been completely off-base. 
Just imagine how completely misled some future historian would be if he tried to rely on the references to our breed that have appeared in the papers over the last couple of years. Chapter 6 Echoes and Reflections Truth Forever on the Scaffold Wrong Forever on the Throne Lowell my writings on dogs have appeared in a variety of publications such as Bloodlines Journal, Sporting Dog Journal, and Pit Bull Gazette. I am including some of them in this chapter. Along with my own, I am also including a few articles by other authors. I would have included more, for many worthy articles have appeared, however, as my wife pointed out, the book is supposed to be by me. This first article is special to my family. Belle was our favorite house dog of all time. She had been given to me as a pup by Bert Sorrells. She was taken from us all too soon in the prime of her life by a botched up hysterectomy. About the time of her death, the publishers selected her picture for the cover of my first book. It was small consolation to my family but it was a nice memorial for a worthy dog. Au revoir, Belle. Richard F. Stratton. Bloodlines Journal, March-April 1977. She was so much a part of our family that even now, a year after her death, it is difficult to write about her without feeling a touch as for the charge of being a bully, it all depends on your point of view. To the hounds the pit bull may seem like a bully, even though he is invariably smaller than the hound, but the object of the hound's affection is the raccoon, an animal considerably smaller than the hound's, and to top it off, he rarely gets to go. One-on-one -on -one with a hound. Rather, he has to handle several at one time. Now, what was that breed again that was called a bully? Close Encounters of the Cur Kind Richard Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, November 1978 First, let me reassure all of my friends that this article is not about their breeding programs. And is not about mine either. Rather, this will be a series of articles that will appear at irregular intervals and will deal with incidents in which a particular pit bull has been in a fight with a non-pit bull. In telling these stories, it is not my intention to encourage anyone to allow his pit bull to fight a cur. The contrary, in fact, for such fights are a cruel thing. Although the cur may be full of fight in the beginning, he soon becomes a beaten and terrorized animal. Unfortunately, the pit bull is unable to comprehend that another animal would not delight in fighting, just as he does, so he won't let go, no matter how much his opponent yells. I have often been amazed by the number of people that seem to find nothing wrong with a cur taking his lumps. A breeder of Staffordshire's took great delight in telling my wife and me about how his show champion killed his neighbor's husky. The thing that dismayed us the most was that it took 12 minutes for the kill, and our staff enthusiast watched the whole thing from his kitchen window and made no effort to stop it. This incidentally was a man that was fanatically opposed to pit fighting. There may be times, though, when a cur deserves to take a few lumps. A case in point was a time that I unleashed my dog Honey Bear on a Great Dane. The justification in this circumstance was that the Great Dane was mauling a nine-year-old boy. I was perhaps a hundred yards away, and I was the closest person to the scene. As I ran through the heavy snow to save thee of sadness but she deserves to be remembered and written about. She was the one that finally won over my wife to the breed. When we were first married over twenty years ago, my wife had a delightful Shetland sheepdog, and I had two Wallace-bred American pit bull terriers. Sable, my wife's dog, 
was an unusually intelligent animal who had been hand-raised and taught to do a lot of cute tricks. Quite frankly, he was loaded with personality and was one of the smartest dogs I've ever known. The very smartest dog I knew was an APBT. My pit bulls, on the other hand, were kennel-raised and got precious little attention from me, as I was busy with my studies in college. Being raised as they were, the only trick they could do was to make a dog disappear. And I was pretty sure that my wife wouldn't care for that trick. Round one went to the Shetland Sheepdog. Later on when my boys were babies, we had a Wallace-bred old family red-nosed dog named Sam as a house pet. He was great with the boys, and I recall how my father-in-law was highly impressed with his deportment. However, an incident in our town in which a German shepherd killed a small child entrusted to him so horrified my wife that I knew she would never rest easily with Sam as a house dog. So I got the family a dachshund pup, and poor Sam was relegated to the kennels. Round two went to the dachshund. Finally, when the boys were older, I brought home a little pied pup with a pink nose. The boys named her, Belle, and doted on her. By the time she was grown, she had won my wife over completely, as she acknowledged that Belle even outshone the memories of her beloved Sable. For Belle could do tricks, too, and many of them were self-taught. In addition, she had the typical pit bull zest for life that is downright contagious. Her excitement and enthusiasm made every outing an adventure for her and somehow less mundane for the rest of us. She was a joyful companion, and she brightened our days. Not everything was all roses, of course, during her time with us. For one thing, she had a penchant for killing skunks, and we soon learned where the skunks lived, or at least used to live. We also found a chemical that killed skunk odor even better than tomato juice. As bad as she was with skunks, she was amazingly good with other dogs. We were able to take her with us and allow her to run off lead in the areas in which such things were allowed, and she never bothered a dog that didn't make the terribly self-destructive mistake of jumping her first. One of her favorite romping places was at the beach where she liked to swim out and do battle with the waves. I have noted that retriever trainers are careful never to start out their water dogs in ocean water. They are afraid that their dogs may swallow some salt water and lose their incentive for swimming. But Belle swallowed half the ocean and never lost her enthusiasm. Freshwater lakes and streams must have seemed a little tame to her after surfing in the ocean, but she managed to have fun in these areas, too. She was obviously an ecologist at heart, as she retrieved all the floating debris from lakes, dropping it at our feet for us to put in the trash. In a bay area near our town, dogs are allowed to run loose legal ly, and it is here that people bring all manner of dogs to romp. It is a delightful area, and is perfect for training retrievers, bird dogs, and beagles. But, whenever we were there with Belle, she stole the show from all the rest. People seemed only to have eyes for her, and all the other dogs were neglected. The owners of other dogs even pestered us, wanting to know what kind of dog she was and where they could get one like her. Well, I'm not sure that there are many like her around, but we have a puppy now that sure looks like her and shows lots of promise and personality. Although this new pup will replace Belle as our house dog, our family, and my wife in particular, will always remember Belle as a very special dog. Bob Wallace Richard Stratton Pitbull Gazette, March 1977 It's funny how erroneous impressions tend to persist in spite of what anybody says to try to dispel them.
Two such fallacies regarding Bob Wallace immediately come to mind. One is the idea that Bob Wallace and Bob Hemphill were partners in the breeding of their dogs. Some people even refer to the Wallace-Hemphill bloodline. The other is the notion that Wallace was primarily a breeder of the old family Red Nose line. It is true that Bob was an admirer of the old Red Nose strain, but his original line consisted of little bundles of dynamite that were generally quite variable in color. Of course, even though Bob's original line didn't show it, they carried a substantial amount of the old family red nose blood. Since Bob had always considered Jim Corcoran to be perhaps the greatest breeder of all time, he selected as his foundation bitch a game little Shipley bitch named Penny. The old-time Shipley blood was descended directly from the Corcoran line. Penny was bred to Centipede, one of the great red-nosed dogs of his day. From this breeding came Stinger, Scorpion, and Spider, all of them game and rugged pit dogs. Spider was bred to Circe Jeff, generally considered the greatest pit dog of his day, to produce Madam Queen. When Circe Jeff was owned by Dr. Hall, he was matched into two Leitner dogs, and one handily over both of them. However, the losing dogs showed such gameness that Joe Curvino of Chicago obtained a litter sister to these dogs and bred her back to Circe Jeff. A pup from this breeding was also sent back to DR. Hall. Wallace later obtained a grandson of this little bitch, and he named him Tony. Tony became famous for one of the gamest scratches of all time, at Rulesville, Mississippi, and he later was bred to Madam Queen to produce King Cotton. It would be instructive at this point to mention the colors of the dogs we have been talking about. Penny was red with a black nose. Centipede was red with a red nose, Spider was red with a black nose, Madam Queen was a brindle with a black nose, and King Cotton was white with a black nose. We see, therefore, that the Wallace line did not show the red nose even though the old family red nose strain was an important component of the line. We find that the Wallace bloodline was an amalgamation of the Corcoran, Shipley, Leitner, and the old family red nose strains. Many years later, Wallace felt that his bloodline was losing some of its vigor and bite, so he analyzed the options for an outcross. In those days, strains were kept more pure than they are now, and breeders dreaded the time that was bound to come when they would have to think in terms of breeding to an outside strain. Wallace especially dreaded the idea of a rank outcross in which there were no common bloodlines. Finally, he had the inspiration to utilize the old family red nose line, and it was at this time that he obtained what was left of that old strain and kept it pure to utilize as a cross for his main line. When I first visited the Wallace's seven-acre country home, the red-nosed dogs comprised only a small portion of the dog aggregate, and they were kept in their own section of the place. And a beautiful place it was too. I was especially impressed with how the dogs were kept. There were kennel runs and large spacious pens for puppies, but the adult dogs were kept on pulleys attached to cables. I had always felt that the cruelest aspect of any activity involving any breed of dog was the confinement that was necessary for keeping a large number of dogs, however, the Wallace dogs on, in my humble opinion, Bob, Wallace, will go down in pit dog history as one of the all-time great breeders. Bob is a perfectionist, a breeder that plans his breedings years ahead and leaves nothing to chance to establish the correct pedigree of any animal he uses. Impatient with those who are never sure or are careless with the recorded breeding of their dogs, Bob's word is his bond. 
I would unhesitatingly accept his version of any breeding on any dog, no matter how controversial the known pedigree might be. Educated, intelligent, a successful businessman, a sportsman who will meet any man and lay his money on the line, Bob would be a credit to any sport where sportsmanship prevails. Happy New Year to Mr. Robert Foster, Bob Wallace. Gene Carpenter. Pitt and Pal, January-February 1979. We want to start the year by honoring Mr. Bob Wallace. Mr. Wallace is a household word to pit bull owners old and new. He is also known for the old family red nose strain, his honesty, and for being outspoken when called for. Mr. Wallace played football and boxed in his younger days and never lost interest in the pit bull dogs. No matter how many pits he had on his yard, sometimes fifty to sixty, he always had a couple of good bird dogs, as his second love was quail hunting. Mr. Wallace worked for Libby McNeil Libby as sales manager until liquor was legalized and he became connected with a well-known Kentucky distillery in 1942. He left the distillery and opened his own retail stores in the Little Rock, Arkansas area. He owned and operated five retail stores until his retirement in 1960. He made his living from his profession. His dogs were a hobby, not a way to make money. Mr. Wallace said he sold a total of ten pits in his life, but he had placed some in the hands of fanciers who would recognize their true value and give them a chance to prove it. Mr. Wallace was born in Van Buren, Arkansas, May 28, 1904. He received his first pit bull dog at the age of four from an aunt. Due to a no-money match between his pit and one of his father's coon dogs, guess who won, his father found a new home for the pit. Mr. Wallace not being a quitter had many pits during his teens. When he was 13 he met Mr. Ben Flannery, a well-known dog fighter of his era. Mr. Flannery told him all about dog fighting and Mr. Wallace really got the pit dog fever. After he became grown and married to the lovely Doris DeWitt Wallace, they bought a pup from the Dugan's Pat bloodline. His name was Spike. This was the pit he had his first money match with and won in 39 minutes, over Charlie Beckles, Pat, out of Paris, Arkansas Spike broke Pat's hind leg and was picked up. Mr. Wallace did not condition and handle all the dogs that he fought. This was true of his good friend, Mr. Joe Curvino, whom he considers the best breeder of his day. Mr. Wallace said that dog breeders and dog fighters were two different categories and only a few had the time to do both. Mr. Wallace and Mr. Curvino never met, across the pit, but on one occasion, King Cotton, Wallace breeding, and Davidson's Blackie, Curvino breeding, were matched and King Cotton won in one hour and forty-four minutes. Mr. Wallace said that Mr. Curvino was a top dog man, a breeder second to none and a credit to the game. The man who helped Mr. Wallace start his bloodline and contributed the most to his success was Mr. Oscar, Chuck, Huff of Bossier City, Louisiana. Chuck gave him Penny, a shipley red bitch for his foundation bitch. Mr. Wallace said Chuck was known to all pit dog breeders and fighters as a man of honor, good as his word, truthful and honest. A group of traits hard to find in any man. Mr. Huft hung up his breaking sticks in the mid-forties. He is now eighty-four years of age and still has a couple of good pits in his backyard. I asked Mr. Wallace to compare today's dog men with yesterday's dog men. He said it would be difficult, but all in all, they compare favorably except for one small detail, 
the desire to shortcut time-tried conditioning methods and the use of chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and medicine today as compared to the old time. Natural Methods This has resulted in fewer dogs being put in top shape for long matches. But, they seem to have more, chew em up and spit em out type of dogs today. Mr. Wallace sometimes refers to the younger men as the Pepsi generation. Mr. Wallace said the greatest dog he ever bred was never fought for money. He was a pure red nose named Curly Wallace's. Red Brave, Pit Weight 48. He three dogged him and nearly killed him. He could bite, wrestle, and he was a smart fighting dog. He nearly died from the gameness test and Bob promised Mrs. Wallace that he would never fight him again, so he became the house pit. The Wallace's house pit today is a line bred. Rascal, Curvino dog named Wallace's Little Joe, a red and white, three-year-old that travels with them. Mr. Wallace, we wish for you. Good health and lots of happiness in the new year and keep scratching. The Reverend Hainzel. Richard F. Stratton. Bloodlines Journal, March-April 1977. It has been my good fortune and pleasure to have known some of the great all-time breeders of the American Pit Bull Terrier. One of the most engaging is Howard Heinze of Tempe, Arizona. Howard's reputation as a breeder of quality dogs is unassailable, but he is also known for his entertaining wit. As I've always said, you have to listen quick when Howard talks because he talks in such a quick and concise way he gets a normal hour's dissertation into about five minutes talking time. Since his experience with the dogs goes back to the days of Con Feely and George Armitage, he has many fascinating and entertaining stories to tell about the great old dogs and their owners. My wife thinks that he is funnier than Burt Reynolds and better looking too. For some reason that I'm not sure about, Howard is often affectionately referred to as the Reverend Hainzel by other dog men, and he often signs his letters in that way. Perhaps he attained the title from the narrow path that he exhorts APBT fanciers to follow. He has absolutely no patience with those who neglect their dogs, and he is not shy about letting anyone know about it. He practices what he preaches, too. His dogs are religiously picked up after twice a day, are kept free from fleas and flies, and are provided clean and comfortable quarters. Personally, I think we need more reputable breeders like Howard to put pressure on would-be dog men who want the dogs, but are lazy about caring for them. Howard has also been very interested in dog nutrition, and, of course, provides his own dogs with a scientifically oriented diet. In addition to pit bulls, Howard raises thoroughbred racing horses but his prime interest is always the good old American Pit Bull Terrier. Howard names Con Feely, Rip Torn, John P. Colby, and Earl Tudor as the top dog men that he has known in his lifetime, and as it turned out, it was a cross of the Colby and Feely bloodlines that produced Debois. Debois became famous as the most prepotent stud dog of modern times. Heinze refers to his old Duchess dog as the best pit bull he ever owned or saw, but he is probably more famous for his association with Debois and the immortal White Rock. Another dog that is brought to mind when you think of Howard Hainzel is Gringo. Gringo sired some great dogs, and, consequent L.Y., is way back in the pedigrees of many dogs across the country. Since he is so far back in all those pedigrees, you would not expect him to be still around. But he is still alive, twelve years old and still siring pups. Perhaps. On forever like the Reverend Heinze himself.
Ugly is Beautiful Richard F. Stratton Pitbull Gazette, Fall 1976 Is the American Pit Bull Terrier ugly? That may not be the burning question of the age, but it is worth considering. Obvious L.Y., some people much to the amazement of the pit bull fanciers do consider the breed to be a trifle homely. As an example, Dr. Leon Whitney, the famous author and veterinarian once mentioned the American pit bull terrier as a breed that he particularly admired, but he allowed that the dogs had a homely and pig-like appearance. He emphasized, however, that appearance was of little consequence and that it was the cold steel of the mind that was what really counted. Actually, as we all know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. If you are accustomed to collies with their absurdly narrow heads and long pretty coats, that are forever tangled and knotted, then the pit bull with his burly build and lantern jaw will probably look a little ominous to you. Actually, however, I think pit bulls have a tendency to take the prizes in both directions. Some of them have such a bad case of the uglies that they are downright laughable. Others have the beauty and grace of a young mountain lion and would be hard to beat, in anyone's eyes, by any other breed. The problem is that some of our best dogs may look like mutts that most people wouldn't even bother to pick up off the streets. The same thing is true of other performance breeds. A show setter, for example, has a ponderous head and an exaggerated coat which, I suppose, is to make him beautiful, while many of the field trial winners are hardly recognizable as a pure breed. Another example is the marvelous Border Collie, who could no more win a dog show than Lassie could herd sheep, but which is to be the most admired and which has the better breeding. Isn't it possible to have your cake and eat it too? That is, can't we breed for gameness and for a good-looking dog at the same time? Well, certainly it is possible if we maintain our priorities. And put gameness first. It sounds simple, but it is much easier said than done. Besides when a big scruffy looking dog turns out to be an ace, somehow there is just not a better looking dog around anywhere. It is easy to be led astray once we begin selecting primarily on the basis of appearance. I have noted that some individuals have, after hearing about the old family red nose strain, decided that they want to start a new strain based on the blue nose that is sometimes seen in this breed. The implied assumption here is that the red-nosed dogs were bred for the color of their nose, but the truth is that they were not. It just so happened that a number of dogs from the old family, an inbred Irish strain, breedings just happened to throw a lot of red-nosed dogs. When these individuals were bred to each other, they produced all red-nosed pups. The appeal of these dogs was their gameness and not the color of their noses. As a matter of fact, most of the early dog men had a hard time getting used to those red noses. In fact, Mr. Leitner, who bred many of the progenitors of what later came to be known as the red-nosed dogs dropped that line of dogs, partly because they were running too big for him, but also because he didn't like the red noses. Well, the truth of the matter is that red-nosed dogs look pretty good once you get used to them and are aware of the spectacular gameness that has generally been associated with the strain. For those that don't think so, let's just say that ugly is beautiful. History Anyone Ralph Greenwood Pitbull Gazette, May 1978 the following account was sent to us by Greg Replago, a fancier from New Mexico. It is reprinted in part from the 1815 First American Edition of Woods Natural History. 
Many people believe that the English bull of this period in history was crossed to produce the American pit bull terrier, while others claim that this was the original American pit bull terrier, before they were imported into the United States. I will let you be the judge. The English Bulldog The Bulldog is said, by all who have had an opportunity of judging its capabilities, to be, with the exception of the game cock, the most courageous animal in the world. Its extraordinary courage is so well known as to have passed into a proverb, and to have so won the admiration of the British nation that we have been pleased to symbolize our peculiar tenacity of purpose under the emblem of this small but most determined animal. In height, the bulldog is but insignificant, but in strength and courage there is no dog that can match him. There is hardly any breed of sporting dog which does not owe its high courage to an infusion of bulldog blood, and it is chiefly for this purpose that the pure breed is continued. We have long ago abolished those combats between the bull and the dog, of which a few bull rings still remaining in the ground are the sole relics. In these contests the dog was trained to fly at the head of the bull, and to seize him by the muzzle as he stooped his head for the purpose of tossing his antagonists into the air. When he had once made good his hold it was almost impossible for the bull to shake off his pertinacious foe, who clung firmly, and suffered himself to be swung about as the bull might choose. There seems, indeed, to be no animal which the bulldog will not attack without the least hesitation. The instinct of fight is strong within him, and manifests itself actively in the countenance and the entire formation of this creature. It is generally assumed that the bulldog must be a very dull and brutish animal, because almost every specimen which has come before the notice of the public has held such a character. For this unpleasant disposition, a celebrated writer and zoologist attempts to account by observing that the brain of the bulldog is smaller in proportion to its body than of any other dog. But Stonehenge well remarks, that although the bulldog's brain appears to the eye to be very small when compared with the body, the alleged discrepancy is only caused by the deceptive appearance of the skull. It is that the brain appears to be small when compared with the heavy bead and ECS, but I the brain say he or the muses it the. Of the body, it will be found rather to exceed the average than to be below it. According to the same writer, the bulldog is really a sufficiently intelligent animal, and its mental qualities capable of high cultivatine. In all tasks where persevering courage is required, the bulldog is quietly eminent, and can conquer many a dog in its own peculiar accomplishment. The idea of yielding does not seem to enter his imagination, and he perseveres until he succeeds or falls. One of these animals was lately matched by his owner to swim a race against a large white Newfoundland dog, and won the race by nearly a hundred yards. The owners of the competing dogs threw them out of a boat at a given signal, and then rowed away as fast as they could pull. The two dogs followed the boat at the best of their speed, and the race was finally won by the bulldog. It is rather remarkable that the bulldog swam with the whole of his neck out of the water, while the Newfoundland only showed the upper part of his head above the surface. The way it was. The Farmer Pit Bull Gazette, Spring 1977 Since many people who own pit bulls today have never seen a professional contest, it should be stated for their benefit what was perfectly obvious to one who had watched hundreds of money fights, dogs don't all bite the same. Even as the dogs were not equally game, or equally quick, or equally strong, they also did not bite equally hard. Some pit bulls could fight for two hours and never break the skin, although most dogs that made it to the pit for money could do a fair amount of damage. However, 
Some few dogs stood so far above the others in this category, that all dog men who had seen them, friend and foe alike, agreed they were hard biters. Nothing so moved an old-time pit bull fancier to eloquence as the memory of a hard biter. While the deep game dog has been universally sought, the gambler's little darling was the ruthless executioner who could disable his opponent with the first hold he took. Dogs by the names of Black Jack, Benny Bob, Spike, Jimmy Boots, Mondigo, and White Rock have become legends in various parts of the country. Those dogs, because of their natural ability to bite, were as close to a sure thing as a gambler will get. To the dog fighter, the hard biter offered in addition to the awesome display of brute destructiveness, a cliff-hanging suspense, generated by the fact that very often no one knew how game the dog was. He usually demolished his opponents in his additions, and no one ever saw him in trouble. It was usually unspoken, but backer and opponent alike harbored a secret suspicion that he'd turn and run if he had to take what he was dishing out. Some hard biters got the opportunity to prove that they were, indeed, game dogs. Others the reverse. But it rarely happened, because hard biting dogs were rare and they seldom met one another. Why were they rare? Every dog fighter that ever stepped into a pit dreamed of having one of those crippling, shocking, iron-jawed alligators in his hands. Couldn't that trait be consistently? The start of a classic match in the thirties between Curvino's Smilin' Jack and Emerson's Thunder. Both dogs had it all, wrestling ability, hard bite, indestructibility, and gameness. Reproduced in the breed? Apparently not. I never heard of the sons of Black Jack or Spike duplicating their sire's abilities although many fine fighting dogs sprang from those lines. Admit Tedley, there were families of dogs that seemed to be harder biters than others, but I'm not talking about the kind of better than average biter. I'm talking about the dogs that bite an opponent in the chest and kill him if the owner didn't give up the fight. The Super Biters. They were rare. They will become even more rare, for two reasons. One, they can only be identified under pit conditions. Two, whatever physiological and conformational traits that play a part in giving the dog his biting advantage are not readily visible to the breeder. Let's take a look at the first problem, identifying the truly hard biter. Look at, old Tige, hang on that sack. Locks them jaws right up, boy. Well, that sack, or leather strap or piece of rope, or cowhide, doesn't have him by the front leg, jamming him into the siwarna, trying to tear his shoulder out. You might be surprised to see that old Tige couldn't get his teeth together under such conditions. Against a worthy opponent, a hard-biting dog could take a shoulder hold and immediately penetrate the hide, sink his fangs through an inch and a half of muscle and clamp it like a vice. Mew CLE was bruised and torn, nerves were cut, the whole area filled with blood and became inoperative in a few minutes. Your average good fighting dog took the same hold, broke the skin, pinched the muscle and bruised it, while the light biter, who in his own way may have been a fine fighting dog, didn't break the skin, but bruised the muscle. The effect of one was immediate, while the last was scarcely noticeable. These effects were only valid when tested against a comparable athlete. Many a gambler was dismayed to see that his hard-biting champion, that had literally destroyed his no-talent brother at home, couldn't break an egg when confronted by a conditioned pit dog. Why did a dog bite hard against one opponent and not another? Why did he bite hard on a rag? but not in the pit. 
Well, for one thing, the rag didn't fight back. Like a puncher, he needed to have his feet on the floor to get power. He needed to set his feet, use his shoulders, back and neck to drive those teeth home. If his opponent could back him up, keep him off balance, take away his leverage, he did a lot to lessen the power of his bite. Consequently most hard-biting dogs were also strong dogs. They could take the advantage and keep it. They were conditioned by men who knew what they had and didn't take the bite out of them by conditioning them for a marathon. Since strength was so important, they never really knew until they set him down with another pit quality dog. By the way, real dog fighters knew this. Anytime you hear of a pit bull being sicked on a cur dog, or a puppy or whatever, you can bet it's not a dog fighter tuning up his champion, but some nut amateur stroking his ego. Can you imagine AJ Foyt testing his indie car by blowing off somebody's 57 Chevy? From there, we go to the second problem of breeding hard biting dogs. What about the physiology and conformation? Look at the pictures of those legendary hard biters. Their heads were all shapes. It didn't seem to matter if the dog had a long muzzle or short, whether he was undershot or had an even bite, whether the head was big or small. Teeth not only frequently did not meet evenly, but were not necessarily long and sharp. Whatever common denominator of bone and muscle relationship that existed in those hard biting dogs is not readily apparent. I suspect that there is a strong correlation between the length of the coronoid process on the jaw, and the attachment of the temporal fossa muscle. It stands to reason that the farther the temporal fossa muscle is attached from the pivot point of the lower jaw, the greater the leverage that can be applied in closing the mouth. If this is true, then brood stock could be selected on the basis of measurements of the bones and muscles of the skull. All it takes is a breeder who can dissect the heads of his brood stock before breeding since this muscle and its attachment are internal. Seriously, there is a greater pitfall in attempting to breed selectively for a hard bite. Bulldogs are what they are because of their hearts, not their teeth. Whenever a breeder has selected for a physical quality rather than gameness, he has invariably lost the gameness. A bulldog without gameness is like a car without a driver, the horsepower is no good until it's driven. Regardless of how hard he can bite, he won't bite hard unless he wants to. I remember sitting in one of those smoke-filled motel room bull sessions on the eve of a convention and listening to dog men discuss the possibilities of producing hard-biting dogs. The late Frank Fitzwater put an end to the discussion when he said, Boys, breed your game dogs and you'll get your fightin' dogs. Bulldogs and Dragons Richard F. Stratton Pitbull Gazette, Summer 1977 More years ago than I care to remember, my second grade teacher read a story to the class about a dragon that preyed upon a group of gnome-like creatures. Now of course, the dragon was the villain of the book, but a small group of us were iconoclastic enough to side with the dragon. After all, the dragon was a much more exciting creature than the gnomes. He was huge and powerful, and he could fly in breath fire, too. Besides, we reasoned, it wasn't the dragon's fault that he had to eat gnomes for a living. Well, of course, the dragon was finally destroyed toward the end of the story, and my friends and I observed a suitable period of mourning. Now after forty years, I don't remember the name of the book that was read to us, but I never forgot that dragon. I don't know if dragons will ever receive redemption, 
but I know that some of us were ahead of our time in protesting the attempted extermination of such predators as hawks and mountain lions. It is not that any of us enjoy the suffering caused by the predation of the various types of carnivores, it is simply that you don't eliminate suffering by eliminating the predators. With the predators gone, the population is still controlled by disease and starvation. And predators are some of the most interesting animals not to mention some of the most magnificent. A predator is likely to be a more intelligent animal too, as it requires more versatility to catch and eat animals than to eat grass or leaves. Those of us who are able to appreciate the songbird and the hawk, the ant and the ant lion, and yes, even the host and the parasite, are those who have come to know nature as she really is, rather than as some idealistic dreamer might prefer. Many of the modern nature freaks are in love with a dream of their own making that has little relationship to the real world. The point of all this is that the world is not always as it seems. In fact, if we look a little more deeply into certain situations, we find that things are sometimes nearly opposite of how they first appeared. Perhaps the following will help to illustrate the point. A few years ago there appeared on television a dog story that contained a pit bull as the villain. Near the beginning of the story, our hero, an otterhound, is jumped upon and soundly trounced by the pit bull. Just to make sure we know that the pit bull is a villain, several characters of the story, mainly hound men, make very disparaging comments about the worthlessness of the breed and how it was a bullying bred solely for scrapping and was good for nothing else. Now if our screenwriters had known what they were doing they would have had their character simply admonish the pit bull's owner for allowing him to run loose, rather than to talk the foolishness that they did. Obviously, the pit bull is good for something besides fighting. His worth as a catch dog is well established. He has long been used as a hunting dog, mainly for wild boar but also as a still trailer for raccoon. On top of that, nearly all pit bulls make excellent pets and house guards. Their nature with people is much better than that of most breeds. As for the charge of being a bully, it all depends on your point of view. To the hounds the pit bull may seem like a bully, even though he is invariably smaller than the hound, but the object of the hound's affection is the raccoon, an animal considerably smaller than the hounds, and to top it off, he rarely gets to go. One on one with a hound. Rather, he has to handle several at one time. Now, what was that breed again that was called a bully? Close Encounters of the Kerr Kind Richard Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, November 1978 First, let me reassure all of my friends that this article is not about their breeding programs. And is not about mine either. Rather, this will be a series of articles that will appear at irregular intervals and will deal with incidents in which a particular pit bull has been in a fight with a non-pit bull. In telling these stories, it is not my intention to encourage anyone to allow his pit bull to fight a cur. The contrary, in fact, for such fights are a cruel thing. Although the cur may be full of fight in the beginning, he soon becomes a beaten and terrorized animal. Unfortunately, the pit bull is unable to comprehend that another animal would not delight in fighting, just as he does, so he won't let go no matter how much his opponent yells. They've often been amazed by the number of people that seem to find nothing wrong with a cur taking his lumps. A breeder of Staffordshire's took great delight in telling my wife and me about how his show champion killed his neighbor's husky. The thing that dismayed us the most was that it took 12 minutes for the kill 
and our staff enthusiast watched the whole thing from his kitchen window and made no effort to stop it. This incidentally was a man that was fanatically opposed to pit fighting. There may be times, though, when a cur deserves to take a few lumps. A case in point was a time that I unleashed my dog Honeybear on a Great Dane. The justification in this circumstance was that the Great Dane was mauling a nine-year-old boy. I was perhaps a hundred yards away, and I was the closest person to the scene. As I ran through the heavy snow to save the boy, I finally remembered that I had a veritable anti-missile missile on a leash who could not only get to the rescue more quickly than I, but would handle things more expeditiously once there. So I dropped Honeybear's leash, and he sped unerringly toward the giant dog. The Dane was shaking the frightened boy by the shoulder when a 45-pound tornado came streaking at him out of nowhere, knocking him loose from the helpless boy, and the two rolled in the snow. Quick as a cat, Honeybear downed the gigantic dog and shook him until he rattled. The Dane howled in pain and finally tore loose and bolted away. I grabbed Honeybear up quickly before he could give chase. The other people, by this time, had arrived at the scene. They were full of praise even suggested nominating a Dog Hero Award for him. I directed their attention to the injured boy and suggested that someone find the Dane and his owner, otherwise the boy would have to undergo the painful rabies treatment. Then I spirited Honeybear away. It had suddenly occurred to me that I was technically in violation of the felony dogfighting bill that the loonies had recently rammed through the state assembly. Styles and Wiles Richard F. Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, May 1978 What is the best style of fighting for a dog is a question that was often debated and discussed by the old-time pit dog men. If we examine the opinions of a large number of old-timers, we find a certain consensus of thought. Generally speaking, a dog that fought the head was preferred, and other things being equal, the leg dog was not in high favor because he left himself open to having his nose chewed on. The nose is a very vulnerable spot on a dog. Note the key phrase, other things being equal. It is an important qualifier, and perhaps a few stories about particular dogs with specific fighting skills will illustrate the point. Let's start with Circe Jeff, as he was always a good demonstrator of why a dog should not be a leg dog. Jeff was a brindle dog with yellow eyes, his sire was an old family red-nosed dog, and he was a little shy with people. However, he would kill your dogs for you just as fast as you wanted to set them down for him. Jeff was all but unscarred except for his right front leg. For he would practically place that leg in the other dog's mouth. As soon as a dog was suckered into taking that leg, Jeff had him by the nose, and that, my friend, was the beginning of the end. 4. Jeff had such devastating biting power that he could literally destroy a dog in short order with a nose or head hold. On the other hand, there was Kearns, Red, a dog that always went right for a front leg. In his case, however, things went differently. Once Red got the leg, he shook out the hold so hard and fast that everything was a blur. Not only was the other dog unable to get red by the nose but, as often as not, he was actually lifted clear of the ground by the violence of reds shaking pwr. Although, it was rare for a dog to be able to break another dog's leg especially a bulldog's dash, red broke his opponent's legs with grim regularity, and his matches didn't last long. Who would win if we could magically match Circe Jeff and Red? 
What wins when an irresistible force meets an immovable object? Then there was Dillinger, also known as Curvino's Brad Doc, who was not a particularly hard-biting dog, but he had a way of always getting a dog's ear and letting him wear himself out trying to get to him. The old, boring-in type chest dogs were cannon fodder for him. The harder they drove the more quickly they tired themselves out, as Braddock led them around by the ear. So successful was Braddock that he even won a match when he was 12 years old and was reported to have had 14 wins. On the other hand, the immortal White Rock, who was nearly always listed in the top three of all-time great dogs, was a chest dog that nobody could hold out. Ear dogs were as much cannon fodder for him as chest dogs were for Braddock. For he merely pushed them up against the pit wall and bored right into the chest and let the other dog hold that ear, if he could. Again, who would win if we could magically level the weights and neutralize the time spread? That's a question for which no one has the answer, but I think most old-timers would give the edge to White Rock. In any case, you're beginning to get the idea of compensating factors. All the dogs mentioned had all the normal advantages in addition to a specific supernormal ability. But there were other dogs who won like clockwork even though there was not an outstanding trait at least, not an obvious one. These were dogs that seemingly couldn't be hurt. They absorbed punishment like a sponge, then got up off the pit floor to win. Old Armitage's Q was an example of that type of dog, and it was often the preferred type of many old timers. Getting down into the realm of the normal but tricky bulldogs, we have Wallace's Red Rube. As Wallace said, the only danger of death to his opponents was a rather remote chance of a heart attack or perhaps being struck by a lightning bolt, yet he won some matches and stopped a host of dogs. Where did he fight? Would you believe a pinch of skin underneath the lower jaw? But he was there 90% of the time and whenever a dog tried to twist away, Rube went right with him, just as relaxed as could be, completely frustrating his opponent. As we can see, the question of what style is best is not so simple as it first appeared. Also, we have insight into why it was so difficult for an old-timer to name the most outstanding dog he had ever seen. The Foundation Richard Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, February 1978 While, much to my satisfaction, my book on the American Pit Bull Terrier was received with enthusiastic and nearly unanimous approval, some of the American Staffordshire Terrier people did not care for the book at all. My major crime, it seems, was saying that the staff and the pit bull should no longer be considered the same breed. Now I must admit that I am a little surprised at all this unhappiness about this particular point, since for years staff people have beat their breast and moaned about how difficult it was to escape the pit bull image. The fact that the staff people were the ones unhappy about the separate breed thesis and that most pit bull people applauded the idea says something about the image of the two breeds. Now we must remember, of course, that the staff started out as a pit bull over 40 years ago when it was recognized by the American Kennel Club with aid and encouragement of the Colbys and other influential pit bull people, as well as that of show dog P.O.P.L.E. It is only natural to wonder what went wrong, for the staff has never attained the popularity with the public that the pit bull has, and, of course, most pit dog men regard the breed with very little respect. I think the main problem was the staff breeders became slavishly devoted to show points and were never concerned with gameness or performance in any way. Of course, 
Many of the people were against the fighting of dogs. But that is true of most pit bull people too, but they breed to stud dogs, at least, that are proven game, at least the good breeders do. Staff people seem to feel that they could just take gameness for granted. In fact, many years ago a famous staff breeder made a pronouncement that breeding for show was a much greater challenge than breeding for the pit because when you bred for the pit you were breeding for only one trait, gameness, but when you bred for show you were breeding for a variety of things, show points. He went on to say that some pit dog men bred their dogs so game that you had to feed them with a shovel. Well, on the second point, our staff man has confused aggressiveness with gameness. Very few pit dog men will tolerate a man fighter anyway, mainly because most man fighters turn out to be curs. Even aggressiveness toward other dogs is not a reliable indicator of gameness. Some of the gamest dogs have been easygoing animals that showed little aggressiveness outside the pit. In the first point, our staff expert simply reveals inordinate ignorance. Gameness is a simple name for a complex trait that probably involves blood chemistry, heart and lung structure, brain chemistry, neurological structures, and tissue structure, among other things. There is probably at least one gene for each of these traits and very likely even more. The polygenetic nature of gameness makes it a trait that is indeed a challenge to breed for. In any case, staff people, including our expert, have certainly failed miserably to maintain gameness, as easy as that task should have been. Ah well, none of this means we shouldn't show our dogs, of course. But, we should remember our priorities gameness first. In fact, gameness must be a starting point, the foundation on which all else is built. Luckily, with the ADBA, we have a better standard than the staff people. In fact, it is one of the best of all show standards, and, obviously, considerable thought and study went into it. But let us not be blinded by it. There are, and there will continue to be, dogs that don't fit the standard but leave nothing to be desired in wrestling ability or anything else. Good dogs come in all manner of shapes and builds, and I know our editor will agree with me on this. So let us show our dogs for the fun of it, so the public may see what a pit bull is really like. But neither let us forget that it is not what a pit bull looks like that makes him the greatest fighting machine the world has ever known. The way it was. The Farmer. Pit Bull Gazette, February 1978. Gamest dog that ever looked through a collar. Hand it out. How many times have you heard bulldog people use those terms? Especially those who go back to the days when dogs were commonly fought in the pit? And isn't it the truth that one man's dead game was another man's cur? Game and cur have dominated the conversation of American pit bull fanciers since the breed began because it is a natural fact that without gameness, you don't have a fighting dog. Most people who are fanciers of any breed of dog are fascinated by what bulldog people call gameness. Many's the time I've been to a dog show and listened to owners of everything from Irish wolfhounds to Lassa Opsos talk about their particular favorites. Courage, loyalty, persistence, etc. Those are just other words for what we refer to as gameness. It's pretty hard to lie about a shallow rib cage, straight stifle or other conformation points, because they're right out there for all to see. But talk about courage, and man, watch the imaginations go wild. Every handler's dog has a heart like a lion. That's not a problem as long as there's no way to find out, 
but the pit bull fancier was frequently faced with a put up or shut up situation. For that reason we have become much more definitive about those general terms used to describe gameness in other breeds, and also more polarized in our opinions. Many a valued friendship has been destroyed by the injudicious use of the word game and cur. So when is a dog game and when is he a cur? And what distinguished him from dead game and rank cur? If we use the commonly held opinion that a game dog was a dog that wouldn't quit and a cur was one that would quit we're going to be in trouble, because it was the contention of some of the most successful dog fighters and breeders of the past that they'll all quit. True, some of them took their death and didn't quit, but that doesn't mean they couldn't have quit under different kindy tie-ins. In a previous column we discussed gameness and defined it as the will to win. If we can accept that definition, we can also accept that anything that has to do with will is relative to other values that also have a will. For example, the will to survive. As soon as we inject the possibility of relative values into the discussion, we take a giant step toward understanding the driving force that makes the ideal of the American Pit Bull Terrier different from the ideal of all other breeds. We ask him to have the will to win or dominate that is greater than his will to survive. If we had the opportunity to watch hundreds of dogs in pit contests, as many old timers did, we would realize that there are two huge variables in these two competing value systems. One, that the will to dominate varies within the individual. For example, some bitches did not fight the same when they were in heat. Some males' dogs did not fight bitches as hard as other males. A sick or undernourished dog would not be as game as when he'll die. The list could be much longer. 2. That the threat to survival varies with the opponent, conditions of the contest, and the dog's assessment of the threat at the time. I believe that a bulldog somehow equates his ability to dominate his opponent with his ability to survive. You very rarely saw a dog quit if he dominated the fight completely, even if he was very badly injured. However, when he lost the initiative, started to go down, was unable to take his favorite holds, his will to dominate began to be tested. For that reason, Dogs that fought the ear or the nose were enormously successful even if they couldn't bite hard because they frustrated their opponent by holding him off and were able to dominate the action even if they weren't punishing. It also seems obvious that when a dog becomes fatigued, he will be less able to dominate a fresher opponent, and as fatigue becomes severe, he will recognize some threat to his survival which will be computed against how badly he wants to win. There have been many cases where both dogs were going into fatigue-induced shock, but one dog quit before the other. Obviously, some combination of factors gave one dog's will to win precedence over the other dog's will to survive. When a well-conditioned pit dog goes into shock and stands in his corner, does that make him occur? I don't think so, just not. Dead game. On the other hand, if Bowser screams, turns and jumps the pit the first time he goes down, I would say he's gone a long way in the direction of being labeled a cur. Somewhere within these two extremes lay the vast majority of the ancestors of our present-day American pit bull terriers. Hopefully, the dogs on our pedigrees represent the higher end of the scale. How did the really successful dogfighters select their prospects? Many a conversation between bulldog men reflected the importance of selection. For example, one well-known fancier frequently says, a match well made is a match half won. Another time a beginning dogfighter asked a more experienced man, who should have known because he lost more than he won, 
what is the most common mistake made in conditioning? The response was. Conditioning the wrong dog. So how do you determine how game a dog is? Note that we are not asking if he is game or not game. The opinion of some present-day breeders notwithstanding, I submit that you can't tell by the look in his eye. You have to bring into play the conflicting forces of the will to survive and the will to dominate. You have to roll them to see what you've got. Serious practitioners of the sport, that is, those who put their money on the line, rolled their young dog for three reasons, to school the dog, to determine the dog's ability, and to determine the dog's degree of gameness. I never knew a serious dog man who rolled his dogs for any other reason. Sadism is a waste of time, a waste of valuable animals and is an abuse of the purpose for which the dog has been bred. Sadists have been scorned and ridiculed by serious fanciers and should continue to be ostracized with every means at our disposal. However, if the dogs had not been rolled and fought, there wouldn't be an American Pit Bull Terrier today. How did the dedicated fancier conduct his roles? Obviously in looking for gameness, he tried to simulate pit conditions that induced a dog to quit. The degree to which the dog resisted the temptation to save his hide had a lot to do with deciding whether he could win. We already have recognized that fatigue and dominance are the major factors that influence the will to win. Pain probably enters into it but I believe a bulldog's threshold of resistance to pain is so high in the heat of battle that it's not significant. To ensure that some semi-balance of the fatigue would be felt without burning the dog up, dogs were usually rolled when they were a little fat. Thus, they didn't have to stand and watch them for two hours. The dog they wanted to know about was usually rolled with a bigger opponent. The smaller dog would tire more quickly from pushing the heavier weight and would also have considerably less ability to dominate a bigger stronger opponent. The idea was to attempt to discourage your prospect as quickly as possible after, of course, he had developed his confidence in schooling roles, and make your judgment of whether to match him or not without leaving his best fight in the gym. It was a truism that the more a man knew about fighting dogs, the less he needed to roll them. His experience and lack of subjective involvement, led him to rely on signs. These signs were never absolute, but were very subtle and were widely open to interpret a tie-in. Thus when a successful dogfighter brought a dog to the pit and said laconically that the dog had never made a bad sign, he spoke volumes with that phrase, much more than some beginner who bought the dog because he was the color of his wife's hair. The surest sign is to look for a holding dog. A dog that takes his hold and keeps it. Old timers liked a dog that would only swap one hold for a better one. Beware the dog who had a good hold on the nose, ear, or chest and when he went down, released it to grasp frantically for everything in sight. A game dog would keep his good hold and try to wrestle his way up with it. A really game dog would work the hold from the bottom and not put any great priority in being on top. He might also get killed doing this. The more game the fighter, the more pressure he would put on his opponent. Even if he could not get a good hold, he'd always have a nip somewhere, trying to get a better one. Many dogs that were not so game would keep a good hold if they were up, but never kept a hold when they were down. They could win a fight against a dog they could out-wrestle but look out when they got tired and started to go down. Of course a turn was always a telltale sign. If a dog turned his head and shoulders away from the other dog, it was a sure sign he was thinking about getting out. If he fuzzed up at the base of the tail when he lost the advantage, 
or if he howled and cried when bit, chances were that he was not a pit prospect. These were not the only signs. Dogs were judged and evaluated for gameness by the way they scratched, the way they looked at their opponent, or more important, if they looked away from their opponent, and how they felt in the corner. Occasionally, you would hear someone brag about his dog's gameness by saying he had been too dogged. In other words, a fresh dog had been put on him after he had gone long enough to stop his first opponent. The only thing that tells is that the handler couldn't see what he should have seen with one opponent. It meant nothing as a qualitative assessment. The first, and for that matter the second, dog could have been a totally inept bum and you simply were looking at the best of three bums, or they could have indeed been long, hard rolls and your game dog had left 20% of his ability behind him. It was the task of the handler to select the opponents in the role to make the best possible judgment with the least possible trauma. In an attempt to put a handle on this very nebulous subject, I think we can state with assurance that the best dog men couldn't tell much about a dog's gameness in less than 20 minutes. They might roll him for less time and decide to match him based on his ability, but they were betting on his gameness. For in the final analysis, the test was going to the pit for money, one man's conditioning, breeding and judgment against the other man's. When the men who created this breed looked at a dog, they didn't ask, to win. Super Dog or Stupid Dog Richard F. Stratton Bloodlines Journal, January-February 1976 Those of us who are involved with the American, Pitt, Bull Terrier are inclined to regard the breed as a super dog and with good reason. The APBT is possessor of great strength, courage, and agility, and is capable of truly amazing feats. However, some of the gentry that do not really know our breed but feel compelled to discredit it have come up with another twist. First, they tried to say the breed was vicious. Dieted now. So now the word is being put out that the APBT is not too bright. What a way to add insult to injury. When I hear of such stories, I am reminded of Albert Pace and Terhune's response to reports that the Collie was a treacherous breed. In essence, he said that that particular idea was first expressed when the fool killer was away on vacation. Now, I am not here to say that our breed is absolutely the smartest dog that exists. I once decided to try to find out just what was the smartest breed of dog. I decided to look first at breeds of dogs whose work would seem to place an emphasis on intelligence. I studied, to some degree, Border Collies, Queensland Healers, Kelpies, Bird Dogs, and Retrievers. All of these dogs are extremely tractable, but even the partisans of these breeds are seldom wont to claim that their dogs are the most intelligent. The dogs simply have an inborn urge of some kind. For example, a border collie has the desire to stalk sheep. All of this pap about a sheepdog loving the sheep and wanting to care for them is sheer nonsense. However, the Border Collie is gentle with stock and has the urge to gather sheep. So strong is his urge that he must be chained up at night or he will herd the sheep all night long. However, evidence that the herding purge is an embellishment of the stalking instinct is the fact that nearly all young untrained Border Collies or Kelpies want to bite the sheep. As for bird dogs, they simply are fascinated by birds in the same way that sheep dogs are by sheep. In fact, the point of the bird dog is very similar to the eyeing of stock by a sheep dog. As for retrievers, well, they simply have been bred to be tractable, birdie, and to want to retrieve objects that fall from the air. 
I was amused the other day while out playing tennis. One of my famous, if errant, overhand smashes had somehow gone clear out of the court and over the fence. However, I had seen a boy out walking his Labrador retriever, and I knew we would soon have our ball back. There was just no way that Lab could resist his urge to retrieve. Another group of dogs that appears to be especially intelligent are the toys or lap dogs. These dogs do seem to be especially alert and responsive. Obviously, these little dogs have been selectively bred for centuries for their charm. However, small pit bulls often show the same traits. So obviously size alone has a lot to do with the behavior and appeal of small dogs. Poodles are often touted as the smartest of all dogs, and their excellent record in obedience trials is often given as evidence to this claim. However, if adjustments are made in terms of numbers, we find the Shetland Sheepdog has an even better record. And most experts of this breed indicate that it is the shelter's willingness to work more than intelligence that makes him excel in this field. Incidentally, if the percentage factor is once again taken into account the record of the American Staffordshire Terrier, the show counterpart to the APBT, is one of the better ones, too. Now, I said I wouldn't make any claims for our dog being the smartest breed and with good reason. Certain tests done by Psy, knowledgeists indicate that no one breed of dog has cornered the market in the brains category. But there is no denying that we certainly have our fair share of smart dogs. I am reminded of the pit bull that always took his chain in his mouth when he went into his dog house. It seems that there was a large nail in his dog house, left by a careless owner, that the chain used to get caught on. Now, there is, problem solving, that would impress even a cyanologist. I am also reminded of Pete the Pup, the movie star of the 30s and 40s. Actually, despite word to the contrary, there were several, Pete the Pups, and the circle around the eye was painted on. And, even more, I am reminded of Porky, a pit bull that actually talked. She said words like, Mama, Papa, Bye Bye, and, most clearly of all, Eat. A speech therapy professor from a local university taped Porky's ravings, and got down on his hands and knees and tried to see how Porky articulated the words. And Bob and Marcella Wise once told me, in confidence, that their house dog, Sister Sue, was able to articulate certain words. Sorry to let your secret out, Bob, but these people need to know who's going to answer the phone if they call your house. Well, all kidding aside, the good old pit bull may not be faster than a speeding bullet or even able to leap tall buildings in a single bound but he is truly a super dog of sorts. As for his being stupid, that idea will soon go the same route as the old stereotype of the dumb athlete. Given time, ridiculous notions will fall of their own weight. And a filial degeneration to you too. Richard F. Stratton Pitbull Gazette, Fall 1976 one of the historical breeders who has always been of particular interest to me was D.A. McClintock of Oklahoma. As far as I have been able to ascertain, McClintock never matched a dog, yet, his accomplishments as a breeder were extraordinary, and his line of dogs was in particular demand by the dog men of his day. He wrote a number of articles for his contemporary dog magazines, and they make fascinating and instructive reading even today. For example, in one article Mr. McClintock begins by apologizing for a lack of formal education, then goes on to explain filial degeneratian, a concept that even bedevils geneticists. 
Filial degeneration refers to the tendency of the offspring of any breeding stock to revert to the average of the race or strain. Thus, if the two top dogs in the country are bred together, their offspring have only a remote chance of being as good as either parent. Similarly, in humans, if two geniuses marry and have children, the chances of their producing another genius are also remote. The genes are jumbled, and the tendency is to revert back toward the average. Filial degeneration has often been called the drag of the race, however, the same process also works the other way. If two morons marry and have children, chances are their offspring will not be like them. Also, if we breed two curs of a good strain together, we have a chance of getting some game pups. There have been some aces that came from such breedings. Tudor's Black Demon is just one such example. Now, that does not mean that it is all right to breed curs. Please read on before jumping to that conclusion. Dog men have often been perplexed by the fact that certain outstanding dogs would not produce when used at stud. The reason, very likely, was that the dogs were not representative of their ancestry. They were like a good-looking girl springing from a long line of homely ancestors. The girl may be good-looking herself, but her progeny will likely revert back to the average of her line. That is why it is so important to study the pedigree of the animals we are breeding. Just because a dog is good himself does not mean that he will produce good pups. While it is true that some pit bulls who are not game themselves are good producers, I agree with Pat Patrick that this little fact has all too often been used as an excuse for breeding to occur. Whenever we breed to occur, we are throwing the wrong genes back into the hopper to be once again jumbled, and while we may get good results in the first generation, eventually there will be the devil to pay. Anyway, the question is how do we get around this filial degeneration which looms as such a great obstacle to what we are trying to accomplish? Well, the answer is to breed to a quality line and to work to raise the average of the line. That means never breeding to curs and always using quality individuals. Yes, I know that means extensive use of inbreeding, and inbreeding is a big bugaboo to many individuals. However, modern geneticists have dispelled many of the old wives' tales about inbreeding, and we need not worry about using it to our heart's content as long as we are careful to cull out the undesirable traits. It is generally believed that inbreeding causes a decrease in fertility and size, however, hard-nosed selectivity can nullify even these effects. Hybrid vigor is a famous phenomenon that is characterized by increased size and vigor in the offspring. However, geneticists have demonstrated highly inbred lines in which the selectivity of stock had been so stringent that the lines actually lost vigor when crossed with any. Now, Gameness very likely consists of a number of different genes that work together to produce the trait. Unfortunately, there are probably a number of genes that nullify or modify the effect of the desired genes. That's the way things usually work genetically, but of course, no real research has been done on gameness. So our main task in breeding is to purify our strain of these unwanted genes. This takes many generations, and all our work is undone when some yahoo breeds to a dog whose gameness is suspect. We also always take a chance when we outcross to another strain because we may be throwing into the hopper some of the genes that will modify the effect of the pattern of genes that produces gameness in our stock. However, in my opinion, it is better to breed best to best than to stay within a strain but not be sufficiently selective. To sum up. 1. Genetics is nearly pure statistics, 
predictable in only large numbers. Breeding dogs is like rolling dice in that we are jumbling the genes and seeing how they come out on each throw. An edge by limiting the possible combinations. 2. Inbreeding enables us to overcome the effect of filial degeneration by reducing the variety of genes so that we have a better chance of matching desirable genes. 3. Breeding best to best is difficult to fault, however, if this is done without regard to strain, results will be less consistent. A greater strain gives us greater uniformity. 4. The emphasis should always be on the quality, regardless of the breeding model you use, for example, best to best, inbreeding, outbreeding, or whatever. Selectivity is the single most important factor in breeding. Bulldog triumphs. Richard F. Stratton. Pit Bull Gazette, February 1979. After years of being either vilified or ignored, the good old American Pit Bull Terrier seems to be crashing through all barriers of intolerance and ignorance to capture the general public's admiration. For, given the chance to know him firsthand, the average person seems compelled to grant the Pit Bull, at the very least, a grudging respect. The so-called outlaw breed obviously is his own best public relations representative. As evidence of this phenomenon, let me cite a few examples. Item 1 involves my own well-publicized trial. I will have much more to say about this in later issues, but for now just let me say that a second trial, lasting four weeks, resulted in a quick, not guilty, verdict. My attorney, flushed with victory after hearing the verdict, informed the judge that the jury was welcome to keep copies of my book that had been entered into evidence, whereupon the jurors announced that they wanted their copies autographed. As I autographed the books, various different members of the jury told me how they had nearly all decided they would like to have a pit bull. Now, of course, both of my attorneys had indicated previously that they themselves wanted a pit bull, but I just wonder if the prosecutor didn't secretly covet one, too. Incidentally, the attack on the constitutionality of the moronic California law will go on. Contributions were not used for my personal legal fees but are being placed in trust for fighting the law itself. The response, incidentally, was heartwarming, and I thank you all. Item 2 A recent article in a Japanese newspaper begins, In translation, I have always believed that the Tosa was the greatest fighting machine of the canine race. But, my friends, I was wrong. A little-known breed in the United States reigned supreme. At this point, I should explain to the readers that dogfighting is legal in Japan and was once conducted with Akitas, too, but they were not sufficiently competitive with the Tosa. The Akita is a large long-haired breed and the Tosa looks something like a gigantic heavy-jowled pit bull. The journalist in the Japanese newspaper went on to explain how four American pit bull terriers had been matched against Tosas, and all four won. What particularly impressed the journalist was the fact that one of the Tosas weighed 130 pounds and was a grand champion. His pit bull opponent was less than half his size. After taking the bottom for the first 12 minutes, the bulldog got his opponent down and never let him up again. No wonder our journalist was impressed. Even I would have doubted that the APBT fighting by Japanese rules could defeat the Tosa. I am indebted to Gil Garcia, incidentally, who brought the paper back from Japan. Item 3 Frank Ambrose sent me a Xerox copy of a newspaper article headlined, Power Packed Pit Bull is Threat to Thugs. 
The article tells about a wealthy and vastly experienced attack dog trainer who has decided that the pit bull is the world's best candidate as a protection dog. He cites the dog's formidability tie, good disposition, and small convenient size, fits nicely into compact cars. Now here is a man that has had experience with all manner of dogs. While Plunkett, the trainer, is candid about the pit bull's formidability, they can whip any dog in the world, he is even more impressed by another aspect of the breed, it's their intelligence. If I can get ten German shepherds, only three or four may be really bright and easy to teach. With Dobermans, it's an even smaller percentage. But with the pit bulls, I've never had one that wasn't easy to teach and eager to learn. They are exceptional students. It is refreshing change, of course, to have favorable coverage for our breed. But don't worry, there will still be an onslaught of the other kind. Even now, I can envision the hack writers and purveyors of hatred polishing their little axes for a hatchet job on one of the most remarkable animals that has ever walked the face of the earth. Vendetta Richard F. Stratton Pitbull Gazette, May 1979 In the last issue of Pitbull Gazette I reported on a newspaper article that was very complimentary of every aspect of the American Pitbull Terrier. While it was a refreshing change, I predicted that the hate mongers would soon be back peddling their usual drivel. Perhaps hate mongers was too all-inclusive a term. Actually, most of the writing is done by reporters whose job it is to write articles that sell new papers. For that reason, most journalists have a tendency to sensationalize whatever they are reporting. Then, too, we have to take into account that the reporters are spoon-fed a lot of misinformation by supposed experts. And these experts are quoted saying incredible nonsense. Obviously, the pit bull riakis for good copy, especially for the sensationalist-type periodicals, as articles about them have been as numerous as they have been inaccurate. Rather than trying to answer a myriad of writings that have appeared in various newspapers and magazines across the country, let me as an official, expert, court certified, state a few basic facts. Fact 1. The American Pit Bull Terrier is a very gentle breed with people. He is highly intelligent, and he has unusual abilities that make him useful to mankind in a variety of ways, i.e., as a catch dog, a hunter, and a reliable personal guard dog, to name just a few. These traits of the breed are a direct result of his ancestors being tried in the pit. The intelligent, tough, and formidable dogs prevailed. Of course, these dogs also had to be game. And there is evidence that gameness is somehow connected genetically to a steady disposition. Fact 2, the idea of dogfighting being cruel is an absolute myth. If the dogs love what they do, where is the cruelty? Now, of course, the uninformed person has a difficult time comprehending this simple fact. It seems self-evident to them that dogfighting must be cruel. But then it once seemed self-evident that the earth was flat. And having virtually the entire world population believing the earth was flat did not succeed in unrounding it one whit. One reason many people can't accept the non-cruelty thesis is that they project their own feelings into the dogs and therefore they can't conceive of an animal that actually enjoys fighting contact. But the pit bull does. And please give us credit for knowing that. There is nothing more ridiculous than some jackass who never saw two bulldogs fight expounding upon the premeditated cruel tie of dogfighting. Fact 3, dogfighting has gone on for as far back as we can see into the mists of ancient history, 
It is prevalent now, and it will continue to go on in the future. Stricter laws have not even slowed it down. There has been an effect, though, and we will discuss that later. Fact 4. At least 95% of APBT owners do not fight their dogs. However, even people who want the dogs for some other purpose even as just a house pet want dogs from GameStop. Thus, many a person has purchased a well-bred female, raised her up, paid the stud fee for a top sire, and produced a litter of representative pit bull pups without ever becoming involved in the fighting of dogs. Fact 5. In spite of stories to the contrary, deaths in the pit are extremely rare. While it is true that some dogs do die after a match, usually from improper treatment of hypovolemic shock, their longevity rate compares quite well with that of other performance breeds. Stock dogs in Australia, for example, have an average lifespan of three years. While non-game dogs are frequently put to sleep, the same thing is true of bird dogs that won't point. And many a hound has been planted merely because his voice, on the trail, did not suit his owner. Fact 6. There is no more relationship between pit fighting and violence than between pro football and violence. Any thinking person should realize that. The pit bull is popular because he is a truly heroic animal, and various devotees of the breed have stationed themselves at different distances from the actual pit fighting depending upon their own inclination. Incidentally, for those that worry about pro football or even TV violence, there is some evidence recently reported that indicates that such things may act as a safety valve, and thus, make people less inclined to violence themselves. Now, with these facts in mind, we can view all the articles in perspective. Furthermore, taking these facts into consideration, isn't it ridiculous that various humane-oriented groups are pushing for felony laws for intending to fight these dogs, or even for fighting them, for that matter. After all, simple assault on a human is not a felony. And if our critics are really concerned about the welfare of our dogs, they should be advised that the felony legislation they are pressing for in nearly every state is counterproductive to the welfare of the individual dogs. A felony law was passed in my state three years ago. It has not slowed down dogfighting in the state one iota. It has, however, caused some of the most reputable people to give up the dogs or to move out of the state. This trend results in our dogs being left in the hands of those who are not concerned about being lawbreakers. The net result is that, while dogfighting has not decreased, the quality of the people has deteriorated. Such people are more likely to neglect their dogs, and there are fewer people around to influence them otherwise. The question is, do the critics really have the welfare of our dogs at heart? It is a question about which I have serious doubts. Their almost gleeful eagerness to put pit bulls to death, for their own good, of course, shakes my confidence in them. I have often wondered how humane groups could label the pit bull vicious and unsuited for pets, yet adopt out animals that had bitten children as good watchdogs. But from the point of view of a humaniac, a dog that is a danger to animals is to be despised much more than one that merely attacks human beings. Perhaps that attitude explains the hysterical vendetta by the critics and the shrill harangues against our beloved breed that appear regularly in the various press media. The Chicken Cure Richard F. Stratton Pitbull Gazette, August 1979 Well, the San Diego Humane Society finally got a chance to show its teeth here recently when they finally got a conviction on someone for possessing dogs with the intent that they be used in a fighting exhibition. 
The felony conviction carries a maximum penalty of a year and a day in jail plus a $50,000 fine. However, a judge in superior court who is used to sentencing muggers, murderers, rapists, and their ilk is just not going to be inclined to come down heavy on a dog fighter regardless of any silly laws the legislators get stampeded into passing by a lot of idle rich and ill-informed old ladies. The judge reduced the sentence to a misdemeanor and suspended it. Well, needless to say, the Humane Society representatives were enraged, and at this point, they showed their true colors. They began to direct all their energies to getting a court order to have all the man's dogs destroyed. This would be a good time to point out that the Humane Society is by nature a political organization. Accordingly, it has a number of ways of making its influence felt. It gives awards to the district attorney's office, and apparently all the judges are honorary members of the society. However, Judge Levinson, who presided in this case, was candidly puzzled by the society's attitude. He admitted to a feeling that the society was conducting a vendetta against the breed, however, he granted a court order to have the dogs destroyed. Under pressure from defense attorney Matt Lees, though, the judge stayed the execution of the order for ten days. He said he did not want to have the dogs destroyed, but he needed to be given an alternative. Attorney Lees waged a courageous fight for the dogs. He obtained a list of over a hundred people that would offer homes and agree to inspection by the Humane Society. He also obtained a dog trainer to examine the animals and determine if they were suitable as pets. The Humane Society countered by sending their own expert, a dog trainer and owner of the largest boarding kennel on the West Coast. The man's wife is on the board of directors of the Humane Society, so you can imagine just how objective he was in his judgment. And, of course, the point should be made here that dog trainers are no more authorities on dogs than are dog fighters. The real experts are research scientists such as Scott and Fuller, who have been studying the behavior of dogs scientifically for many years. The case ended suddenly when the judge signed an order to have the dogs destroyed. By the time the defense attorney heard about it, the dogs were already dead. The society had wasted no time. There was quite a bit of local television coverage. Attorney Matt Lees was interviewed and spoke forcefully and dramatically against the unseemly vendetta of the Humane Society and the fact that proper protocol had not been followed. The owner was interviewed and could not hide the tears caused by the sorrow of his dogs having to pay the price of his conviction. Obviously, the Humane Society did not reap very good publicity in this incident. And well that they did not, for I knew those dogs, and there was absolutely no excuse for their destruction. There was not a dog there that was a danger to any human. And some of them had been whelped right there in the Humane Society kennels. When a dog kills a chicken, an old farm cure is to tie the chicken around the dog's neck. If I have my way, the Humane Society will not be able to forget its kill either. I plan to do my best to see to it that the ghosts of their victims come back to haunt them again and again. I, for one, would like to know why the Humane Society gives top priority to their vendetta against our dogs and lets unspeakable cruelties go by the boards. I am tired of the cowardly and furtive attitude of many of its officers who mouth their falsehoods to the media and in their private publications. I hereby challenge any Humane Society official to an open debate on the merit of these matters right here in the pages of this journal. Come on out of hiding, guys, and let's let the sun shine in. Liza on the Ice Richard Stratton
Pitbull Gazette, Volume 2 Number 2 Generally speaking, the dog men that have made a lasting contribution to the breed are the more reputable people, such as John P. Colby, W. R. Leitner, and Bob Wallace. The riffraff contribute little of value, and they tend to become lost in the sands of antiquity. An exception, however, comes to mind in the person of Dan McCoy. He was an itinerant fry cook, usually working in the oil fields of Texas. He was famous for two things, his great knowledge of pit bulldogs and his enormous consumption of alcohol. When old-time dog men get together, talk invariably swings around to McCoy and his antics, and each one has a different story to tell. The following is one of my favorites. Around the turn of the century in the small town of Boulder, Colorado, an actor troupe had come to town to present the play Uncle Tom's Cabin. In those days it was the custom for traveling groups such as this to provide a little additional entertainment, such as vaudeville acts, and they often advertised their arrival with a parade. The parade for Uncle Tom's Cabin included two large and noisy Great Danes. These dogs played the part of the bloodhounds that trailed Liza across the ice in the story the troop was presenting. Apparently, true bloodhounds were not menacing enough in appearance for the dramatic effect that the producers of the play desired, so they had substituted the Great Danes. The giant dogs certainly looked formidable all right as they pulled on their leashes and bellowed at the people that lined the streets to watch the parade. One observer, however, was unimpressed, in fact, Dan McCoy chuckled to himself as he saw the dogs approaching and the people shrinking back as they passed by. McCoy slipped away to an alley a few blocks up from the parade. There behind a restaurant was stationed old Denver, a 45-pound veteran of a number of pit contests. Denver was a comical-looking dog, white with a brindle saddle and a patch over one eye, but his fighting ability was substantial. McCoy unbuckled Denver's collar. He didn't have to point the way. Denver had heard the baying of the Great Danes. The dogs in the parade had progressed to within a block of the restaurant when a tornado came charging at them from out of the crowd. Denver's arrival had the impact of an exploding artillery shell. One of the Great Danes was knocked off his feet, and the other was sent reeling toward the crowd. Denver concentrated his attention on the down Dane, and the dog howled in pain and fright. McCoy, meanwhile, ran around in outraged indignation demanding to know over and over again who had let old Denver loose. Well, the Great Danes were eventually saved, and Denver was returned to his quarters. The play was presented the next night, and from what I am told, it was well received. Of course, there were a few giggles from the audience when the hounds limped after Liza across the ice. Somehow they no longer seemed terribly awesome. <laughs>